the consequences of a nuclear exchange, almost no matter how small, could just be completely catastrophic. And so we can't even risk it because the consequences are so great. I wonder if you can kind of explain this in graphic detail as much as you can, really what the consequences are of a nuclear detonation. If we're talking about a single detonation, here's what a single detonation over Washington, D.C., from a typical SS-18, or I think it's now, there's a modernized version called the SARMED. And this is a missile that carries 10 warheads in the near one megaton range. If you want to get a sense of its size, let's go to slide number three. You can see it's nearly 30 meters tall. These are typically housed in uh, underground silos. And um, if you go to the next slide, they would follow a trajectory where they launched a bunch of warheads from the single missile. The way those warheads are deployed is um, you have what's called a, a bus. The, the rocket launches a bus. Let me see slide six. If you see the top uh, on the left, you see the top of this giant missile would have a, a vehicle. It throws the whole vehicle and the vehicle changes directions a little and it can attack many independent targets. So let's go back to slide 14 and show what one of these warheads could do to Washington, keeping in mind that with a single missile of this kind, it would probably be detonated at a relatively high altitude off the ground, as shown in this image. And if we go to the next slide, you would produce what's called a fireball, shows you one second after the detonation of this weapon, which is off the ground. The fireball is produced by the enormous temperatures produced by the nuclear weapon when its energy is released, which happens in uh, a few millions of seconds. So that happens very fast. The weapon is so hot that it radiates into the air around it in, as x-rays. X-rays are totally absorbed by air. The air is not transparent to the x-rays. So it initially heats the air to maybe a million degrees Kelvin, initially. The inside of the weapon, when it's, when it's in the process of releasing its energy, is close to 100 million degrees Kelvin, which is about four or five times hotter than the center of the sun. So this is a catastrophic event. This um, superheated air becomes a bubble in the atmosphere, and it expands at millions of miles per hour initially and slows up to eventually just be a bubble uh, of uh, it's roughly constant in diameter after about one second. And so what you see here depicted is the fireball, which is inside the fireball, the air density is maybe below 1% of the atmospheric air density. The temperature of the gases in the fireball are about 8,000 degrees Kelvin, which is a couple of thousand degrees higher than the surface of the sun. And it is radiating per unit area about two to three times more light and heat than the equivalent surface of the sun, if you put a surface around it. Man. So this is really, uh, and below on the ground, I have tried to put a cloud on the ground because what happens is the light and heat from the fireball is so intense that concrete surfaces will explode. Wow. So much heat comes in that if you think of the surface, so much heat comes and the surface can't transmit, can't uh, transmit the, it's, it gets so hot, it, it, it can't transmit the, the heat energy into the, the body of the material. So the material gets very, very hot in a thin layer and it explodes. So, and um, that causes, of course, then of course, things are blown, things are immediately ignited. That turns out to be more deadly, by far more deadly than the um, effects of the blast. In slide 16, I show what the debris cloud looks like. Bear in mind that the fireball has this is this is a debris cloud created by the shock wave hitting the ground. Notice it's uh, 
significant fraction of a mile in altitude. So you can't see anything on the ground. You, if you were on the street, of course, you'd be dead, you'd be fried. But if you had somehow imagined a person in the street who had not been fried, you couldn't even read a street sign that was 10 feet away. So, you know, it would just be no visibility of, of any kind. And then uh, following this event, you would have mass fires started. And um, so if we go to slide 103, what happens in the aftermath, uh, the mushroom cloud rises and you have a region of fire on the ground because buildings have collapsed, but anything that is remotely combustible is now violently on fire. And you have a vast area on the surface where fire is burning. And so it has an effect like a chimney. You know, the hot, the air that's heated by the fire buoyantly rises vertically. And you get this circulating motion that's shown in this uh, figure. And on the ground where the fire is actually occurring, the wind speeds can easily be uh, 100 miles an hour. So this is just from the sort of the vacuum created by the uh, hot rising buoyant air. If you look at figure 118, this is um, a much less hostile environment. This victim tried to get out of run for safety in a firestorm in Hamburg, Germany that occurred in 1944. And he was literally incinerated. The hot winds were 100 miles per hour. And the te air temperature was above the boiling point of water. And in, in the case of an attack of this kind uh, by a warhead, a modern warhead with this higher yield, uh, you would have a fire well over 100, 150 square miles, not a few square miles like occurred at Hamburg, which was not a nuclear attack. It was just the effects. Yeah. the buoyantly rising hot air and that's that would be one city and you could take out 10 uh, with a single large missile this warheads could be spread over a whole bunch of cities in the northeast so uh this is not something we want to happen anywhere whether it's an enemy or for us